The fight against the spread of HIV has over the years proven to be a difficult one. For many years, the stakeholders involved have put in lots of effort. However, many of them have fallen on the way, many unable to dust themselves and continue with the journey. A big chunk of these have been the victims themselves, people living with HIV or people affected by the scourge of HIV. I kept on defaulting, running away from hospitals and all these things. You know I had grown so weak, I could not work. At the point where I was working, I could not be paid my full pay because uh, the work I was offering was half. So I kept to myself but I was traumatized most of the times. Kenya is a very religious country with a big proportion of the population belonging to one faith or the other. The major faith or religions found in Kenya are Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Judaism, Buddhism, among others. Provision of modern-day health care in Kenya and religious organizations share one long history. The spread of missionary work came in hand in hand with conventional medicine. As we know, the first hospitals weren't in government buildings, they were in temples, and they were in churches. As we talk about county government, the Ministry of Health, uh, and other service providers in health, we recognize that the key role that uh, the church or the FBOs have played historically in establishment of health facilities in this country. Not just in HIV, AIDS care and treatment, but across all the illnesses in this country. They offer faith, they offer compassion, things that we don't offer in the public health facilities, and this makes them a class. So it's very encouraging to learn that uh, this is the additional services that we get from the SPO facilities, and I want to urge you to keep on doing these good things. In the year 1999, retired President Moy declared HIV AIDS a national disaster. Since then, Many institutions have upped their effort towards HIV control and prevention. In the front line has been faith-based organizations. FBOs are rooted in local structures and are therefore in excellent position to mobilize local communities to respond to HIV crisis. During the early years of the HIV AIDS pandemic, many people who worked in HIV AIDS prevention those of religious leaders and FBOs as naturally antagonistic to what they were trying to accomplish. This school of thought has changed now, and today we have convincing examples of FBOs initiatives in which involvement of religious leaders and organizations in HIV AIDS prevention has had major impact. Faith-based organizations in Kenya choose to provide compassionate non-judgmental care for those living with and affected by HIV AIDS because they are morally obligated to support the disadvantage in the society. On the 3rd of November, the FBOs came together for a dissemination forum. This was also a time to celebrate a five-year joint FBO-CDC partnership in HIV response. This event is jointly hosted by KCCB, <coughs> Chuck Coptic Hospital, Eastern Dinali, and Bong in collaboration with the CDC. Kenya has an estimated 1.5 million people living with HIV. One important group of stakeholders not left behind during the event was the HIV victims. These are the success stories of the hard work done by the FBOs. Two victims who access HIV care in FBO-run institutions narrated their stories. First to come on stage was Meresa Atieno from Karungu village in Migori County. Before I started care, I was so sick. In fact, I became so weak. By the year 2000, I had lost my second child unknowingly because during those days, People were not so much aware of HIV AIDS in those areas. So, by the year 2001, I was so suspicious about myself because I was on and off, sick, in the world, out, in the world, out. So, through the support of my doctor, that was Dr. Bertha, 
I decided to go for testing and I was found to be positive. Two years after starting my care, I started coming up. You know, I had grown so weak, I could not work. And even where I was working, I could not be paid my full pay because uh, the work I was offering was half. So I was given half my, my pay. Two years after that, I had come up, I had grown in body size. People were starting, uh, people were really wondering what was happening. And from there, people started coming to me. Some were coming just to find out what I was doing, that I was doing so well. Some started asking me how they could also come up like me. Some decided just to reveal, reveal they, they decided to test themselves so that they could also get the support I was getting so that they could come up. I decided to pursue my college. I was taken very far, that is Garissa Teachers Training College, Northeastern. And when I was coming from down there, people were saying, you are going to die there. Why do you decide to leave what you are doing here, that you are going to die so far? Who will bring you back? It is because of this project yes. that I can now work and work like any other person. Yes. Apart from that, I have some other achievements. Mm -hmm. After my college, mm -hmm. I decided to have my ch children. You know, without a child in our community, you are valueless. Huh? So, <laughs> so my doctor and the counselors, and the, they, they decided to support me. Six years on care. I got my first girl after losing two children. And this one is Rainy Rose. Rainy Rose, I got her six years, when I was six years on care, and she's now eight years old. Then, Nine years on care, I got Sherry Sharon. Mm -hmm. Sherry Sharon is now four and a half years old, and all of them are HIV negative. Wow. HIV negative. Okay. Fourteen years on care, yes. I decided to get my last girl, yes. and this one is yeah. Sweeney Charlie. Yes. Today, third, yes. Sweeney is seven months old. Yes. The first two PCRs yeah. are negative. Wow. Sweeney is HIV negative. Yes. Thank you very much. And this is because, you know... Uh... Next to give a testimony was Reverend Raha Buanjiro, born of a Christian family and with different HIV stereotype stories surrounding her. Rahab had initially refused to accept her status. The results were released to me that I was HIV positive. This was so sad. A saved girl, how? Who have never met a man. And I'm HIV positive. I listened to media and the information that were being given is everyone is dying very quickly when you are HIV positive. And so I was worried, I was confused. I was bitter with God. The latest news I heard by then was, if you have HIV, you would just go for three years, but I told God I, want, I don't want three years. I want 10 years if you are God. I thought 10 years is too many years for God. And in those 10 years, I decided I will not take drugs. By 2007, that's when I was in doing my divinity course, and it's like it clicked in my mind that 10 years are over. And so I went to hospital and I told the clinicians that I've now come, what were you telling me? And I was started with drugs. And that was very nice because it has kept me safe and I have learned through that that God can also heal through Mazari Hospital. And I managed to get a beautiful girl I'm happy with in 40, my 46 years. I uh, we were worried about age, but without God, 
that God can do wonders through our lives. And I'm trying another one. <laughs> there are few challenges that we are, we are facing. And these challenges, we are sure that we are going to overcome them through the safe models. Because we are preaching about the safer practices where ABC is inclusive and saying that it has not worked well. And so we want now the safe model uh, where it's talking about safer practices. It's ABC plus other roots of HIV. You cut all of them. And also there is access to medication and nutrition. We, we, we need all, all of us need that. Through PEPFAR, CDC supported FBO's comprehensive, technically diverse and geographically widespread programs. They provide high quality services to the most vulnerable, often in hard to reach places. I've heard estimates that 40% of medical care in sub-Saharan Africa is provided by faith organizations. And the more adverse the circumstances, for example in parts of the Democratic Republic of Congo, the more likely that care is through a faith organization. And I salute you for that. I really salute you for that. And I emphasize the community trust that characterizes much of your work. The FBOs could not have achieved what they have achieved for the last few years without someone holding their hands. The United States government, through the U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, has been a dedicated partner. The five FBOs that we honor today contribute almost 30% of ART achievements for CDC, uh, about 17% of national figures. These are impressive contributions. Since PEPFAR's inception in 2004, the U.S. government has provided $4.2 billion, that's with a B, in United States dollars in funding to save Kenyan lives. We are proud of that commitment, and we are proud of our partnership with so many people across Kenya and so many people in this room who share the dedication to ending this terrible plague. Thank you for your service to your communities. Thank you for lifting up the lives of those who need your help. And thank you for your equitable access to healthcare efforts. Your years of service and collaboration are something that are deeply grateful. I want to say, Asante San, Asante San. It's just been a pleasure and a great opportunity for me to be a part of the team, the Kenya team, that's known globally for being a strong, dedicated, and committed team. So I want to thank you, and um, I, I also want to uh, thank the org organizers for giving me this opportunity to just share this very special moment with all of you, and just to try to find a way to say thank you very much for everything that you've done. It's easy to, getting the money is probably the easier part, but getting good, solid, committed partners to actually do the work in the country is much more complicated. Collectively, the FBOs have provided HIV testing and counsel to 2.5 million Kenyans. Of those found to be HIV positive, 165,000 are being kept alive through provision of antiretroviral therapy. We recognize and applaud these achievements as we should, and also the unique approaches FBOs are able to bring. And as much as today signifies an end to one phase of cooperation, I believe it also signifies a beginning of stronger health systems, improved health outcomes, and most importantly, the greater reach and greater effectiveness of life-saving services across this country. No organization works alone. The FBOs have closely collaborated with national government and county health management teams. This joint effort has been instrumental in expanding uh, of the services delivery sites to about 18 uh, uh, health facilities in uh, about 26 countries.
counties. All this has led to improved HIV outcomes. Representing the county governments at the event was Machakos County Executive for Health. Uh, the county government in particular, which I represent, continue to collaborate uh, with FPOs through various mechanisms. Of course, we collaborate in issues of human resource for help that we share uh, some of the uh, critical uh, human resource with FBO facilities. We even share commodities. We do joint uh, m and &E. We do share the health information system so, uh, so that we are able to share what diseases or surveillance systems that what diseases are happening across the county. So we recognize this collaboration and it really helps to improve the quality of health that is offered to our people in Kenya. He also pointed out some of the opportunities that FBOs can take advantage of. Every Sunday, every Saturday, every Friday for the Muslims, uh, people visit uh, religious institutions. And I always believe that these are opportunities that we can actually use to pass health messages as a country. Before the priest, before the pastor, before the imam speaks, we can have a health message delivered by a other community health worker, whether health professional. These are opportunities that we can use to actually pass core health messages to our population, to have a wide reach uh, on a weekly basis because we are sure uh, at least Kenyans are religious people and will, in one way or the other, uh, attend churches or, uh, or mosques uh, on, on a weekly basis. Some of our staff have been seconded to those uh, CHMTs, county health management teams, and we also participate in technical working groups at the county level. These TWGs oversee different program areas from PMTCT to care and treatment to TB to supply chain management to other communities like uh, rapid test kits. Representing the national government and the cabinet secretary for health was Dr. Martin Sirengo of NASCOP. The ministry has been on the forefront of revising guidelines. Um, we used to give ART at 200 CD4, we went to 350, we moved to 500, and just recently in July we launched what we call the Answer Sasa campaign for test and treat, where everyone irrespective of their CD4 or immune status is eligible for treatment. According to a study jointly commissioned by the Ministry of Health, NASCOP, and the Kenya Bureau of Statistics in the year 2010, dubbed Service Providers Assessment Report, it was found that 100% of facilities operated by FBOs provided STI services compared to 97% of government-run facilities. The study also found that 91% of FBO-run facilities offered HIV testing services compared to 79% of their government counterpart. I would like to collaborate with government at all levels, national counties. We like to strengthen collaboration with development partners and other agencies that are out there uh, so long as we share you know, the same vision in, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in expanding services to our people. Uh, we also want to mention that we use we have um, provided electronic medical record systems to all our facilities they are able to enter their data into electronic medical records uh, systems and provide data which informs the national program the vision of kenya is to have a hiv free society by the year 2030 that is no mean target by all means however it takes lots of effort and more collaboration to achieve this but we must do more because looking at one of the studies that we did by NASCO called the Mortuary Survey, close to 20% of people are dying of HIV. But about half of those who die, at least attributable to HIV, don't know that they have HIV. So we need to do more to make sure that we avail services for testing and link those who turn positive to treatment. I've always been very passionate about prevention. And Dr. Mogambi, you're right. Prevention is where we are really having a big problem. Because as we talk about one age group moving to adulthood, another one is moving in, and they don't have the information. I've looked at the BOMU 
and the bomb presentation here, maybe it's, it's one thing that we can look at and maybe add some of the information that can include prevention. Because they, have, they seem to have a very good model. Mombasa, Kilifi and Kwale. So you still have the Tataveta and Lamu to be reached. And hopefully other areas where we have many new, many new infections coming in from the same age group. In fact, it's across the board. The age is between what? 10 to 15? That's where the problem seems to be at the moment. I think, Bomo, you are doing a good job. Thank you. And as everybody else is doing treatment, but we really got to turn off the tap. We must turn the tap off if we are going to actually reach the zeros that we are talking about. I'm here to speak about pe pediatric disclosure. My mom dis first disclosed to me my status when I was six years old, early enough to read and write. She laid some storybooks on the floor and I went while reading them. I saw a green thing with many arms, red eyes, and sharp teeth, but small, and sharp but small teeth. You see? Yeah. These are the red eyes, but it is not colored. <laughs> Can you see? Yes. Thank you. These are the sharp, small sharp teeth, but yes, the small sharp teeth. Is it the middle? <laughs> and these are the many arms. I asked my mom what is what it was. I asked my mom what it was, and she replied, "It is the HIV virus." Then I saw a boy laying down, and I asked why. She said, "It was the boy CD4 are being eaten and weakens one's immunity. Hence, when the virus multiplies, it will lead to AIDS." Then I saw three tablets coming to the rescue with funny eyes and smiling. <laughs> I asked which type of tablets were those, and she said that they are the ARVs which came to, to build a wall around the CD4 protecting it. She then told me that I have the virus, and I told her, Mom, don't worry, and the Lord is with us. And then she hugged me. A few years later, I told my mom, I'm ready to start my ARVs. So we went to the clinic and we were given medication and told never to miss even a single dose. <laughs>